Skava, the unique computer that controlled the Chernobyl reactors. This is the first ever documentary about its design, operation and software, and it is a story how this machine was saved for posterity. I remember when I was a teenager I had been reading a lot of books about Chernobyl disaster and practically every of those books explained that the data retrieved from a SCALA system played a very important role in investigation of the accident of April 1986. Too bad that no single book explained it even a little what this computer looks like. What I didn't know back then, that one day I would not only see Skava with my own eyes, but also do something to save it for future generations. It was 2010 when I for the first time visited the Chernobyl nuclear power plant from inside. And while I walked along the famous Golden Corridor, I noticed that there are many doors with signs saying computer room. And what was hidden behind them, like a giant web, covered each corner of the reactor unit. I managed to get behind those mysterious doors only eight years later, and at that time Scala of the Unit 3, the last standing, had already long been torn it off and it was scheduled to be completely dismantled. According to the Chernobyl protocols, that would likely mean it would end up in one of the burial trenches. So the story could end right here, but I love to go big. So I explained what the retro computing is and how popular it is all across the world and suggested that they save the unique computer. And they did. In less than a month, the computer room was cleaned and added to a list of locations you could visit on a power plant tour. So now we can learn much more about it. And let's start with an amazing history of its creation. The biggest problem is that you can't look inside the nuclear reactor when it is operating and frankly if even you get some sort of magic vision you would not get any more control because processes which are happening inside they are very complex and they are developing really fast so you need to monitor all of that apply the control signals and that has such a scale that humans are unable to handle that that's why we needed a special computer in the Soviet Union, the very first machine of this kind was the Karat system of the Beloyarsk nuclear power plant. However, for RBMK reactors, a bigger solution was needed. In the 60s, Soviets had only a few dedicated control machines that potentially could handle this task, and one of them was so-called VNIEM-3 that was created by the Eponymous Institute. To be honest, there is so little information about it that only one thing I could find is this pencil sketch. And based on VNIEM-3, automatic systems were created for metallurgy production in Romania and for a chemical factory somewhere in Russia. Following this, the institute created a more sophisticated system which got the name V3M. This machine turned out to be really successful in both architecture and design aspects. V3M had 20 kilobytes of memory based on ferrite cores, along with a sophisticated interrupt system, error control and correction, and an advanced set of instructions. Therefore, when it came for creating a computer for RBMK reactor, V3M became an obvious choice. So, in the beginning of 70s, VNIEM gets a state contract of developing a new system. The new computer was installed at the Leningrad nuclear power plant, which was the very first to be based on RBMK reactors. So, consequently, it was named the System of Control and Automatization of Leningrad Atomic Station, or simply SCALA. I must say, here is a beautiful play of words in this name, because SCALA means the rock, and the machine proved to be rock solid in its performance and reliability. Inside those racks are hundreds of circuit boards, securely positioned and equipped with double-layered palladium-coated connectors attached to backplanes. For the first time in the USSR, those backplanes were assembled using wire winding, providing 32 points of contact on each pin. All of this, combined with a sophisticated error correction system and system of self-tests, contributed to making this machine exceptionally stable. 
In my search for further details about the history of those computers at the Chernobyl NPP, I dug into my archive materials. While I couldn't find many pictures of historical Scala installed here, I found something really interesting. I checked the internal newspaper of Pripyat that was called the Tribune of Energy Engineers, and today it stands as one of the invaluable sources for really forgotten details about power plant construction and the daily life of Pripyat. On its pages I discovered a few interesting articles discussing the assembly of Skala for Unit 3 of Chernobyl NPP. This work was led by engineer Mikola Kuznetsov and required a team of 15 people. The project began in May 1980, coinciding with the assemble of the control room tree. In fact, there were numerous delays and various issues in preparing those rooms because other departments made their work not as fast as wanted. So eventually there were a lot of leaks in the sailing, there were not enough technical light, and all that pretty much halted overall progress. So it went not as fast as planned. But nevertheless, by the end of November 1980, Scala was ready. But all that was just the beginning, because later we decided to go to the city of Slavutic, the satellite city of Chernobyl nuclear power plant, and there we could meet the actual engineers who worked with the Scala system in the past. I have to say, what we learned from them completely reshaped our perspective. How does it feel? Like childhood, like broken dreams. You can see the prepay we never saw in our lives. That's how I feel it. Love this time. Technically, Skalovich unit is a separate multi-machine complex. The core are those two independent V30M processors and each of them had 20 kilobytes of RAM and 8 kilobytes were shared for both of them. Those processors were connected to special channels that provided a link to various reactor and unit equipment to be controlled. Such as the system of the physical control of distribution of energy emission, system of protection control, system of control of water spending in the channels, and so on. Another set of equipment provided the communication with external devices, such as tape reel drives, punch tape equipment, teletypes, and high-speed drum printers. But also control panels of the computer room itself and the reactor control room. To continue, it's very important to talk also about the software, and the software was based on the virtual machines concept. Basically, Scala had isolated program environments that would prevent any error spreading across the system. Scala doesn't have any operation system in a common meaning, but a monitor and supervisor program. And although there existed an assembler-like autocode, Mostly, the computer was programmed in the machine codes. The main software and data was stored and loaded using six tape reel drives, but the initial bootloader was on a punch tape. The same tape was used to enter corrections to programs, and we found even a picture of a programmer preparing such a tape. That tape was made using such a PL150M tape punch, and we recently restored exactly this type of device. So, check that video after you watch this one. Besides the monitor program, Scala had an entire set of specialized programs that provided further functionality. For example, DREG, which stands for the Program of Diagnostical Registration of Parameters. That program played one of the key roles in investigation of Chernobyl disaster. Of course, we also talk about it, but just a little bit later. But one of the most important core function programs was PRISMA. It is a acronym that stands for Program of Measurement of the Reactor Power. The thing is, the nuclear reactor and subsequent energy emission in the active zone always goes unevenly and PRISMA could predict how it will work based on fuel rod configuration, neutron field configuration, position of control rods, and so on. 
It also could give operators the information about so-called operative resource of reactivity, or in simpler words, how many control rods they can use to reduce the reaction and what is the maximum reaction they can get if they retract those rods. Prisma program also played a key role during the reloading of the reactor, installation of the fresh fuel and also swapping of the fuel from the center to periphery and vice versa. It was needed to do it given that it burned also unevenly and all that required a new set of calculations to be made. And here is the thing, those calculations for reloading had to be made at the same time as the normal operations. Therefore, Scala, being a multi-machine system, could work in two variants, a set 2.0 and a set 1.5, that differed in the allocation of hardware. So, for example, one set could work on operative tasks and another one could prepare a tape with Prisma calculations. It also helped in the case of malfunction of those machines, because as they run self-tests, they give each other an acknowledgement signal. If such signal is absent during a certain period, the second machine considers that the first has a malfunction, retrieves its software from the tapes, reroutes interface channels and takes it to work. And now let's take a look to control panels. In the computer room there is a workspace for DIVD, the computer engineer in chief. This control panel was used exactly to prepare the fuel reloading, entering the calculations of reactor operations and for system maintenance. And next to it is this panel, which is the key instrument for communication with Scala. It is so-called request device. In Scala, every parameter and device has our own corresponding code, and by entering that code you can request the value, send command, or make a specific device active or passive. It is made using this keyword and those indicators. For example, you type here AOP3214 and A stands for the reactor, O for general, P for pressure, and 3214 is a code reference inside the Scala namespace. Then you send it to machine using this toggle switch and it appears on the upper indicator, and on the bottom one you have a response value, for instance 6 kg of force per square centimeter. You know, it reminds me something, specifically the sky on board computer of the Apollo spaceship, because it had this verb and noun system which is somewhat pretty similar. The computer engineer in chief can use this request device to retrieve various data, and also he manages entering reference values, software management and system integrity. And now let's look at the reactor control room. In a certain meaning, the major part of those control panels are in fact front-end interfaces of the Scala computer. In the scope of this, there are three workplaces here. For Chief Reactor Control Engineer, VUR, Chief Unit Control Engineer, VUB, and Chief Turbine Control Engineer, or VUD. Those three places in the control room are really different between each other, but all of them are also equipped with individual request devices. Well, if you have been here on tour, you surely ask it to show you AZ5 switch. So check your pictures. Well, I'm not sure if you noticed them, but you will find request device panels next to AZ5 and bus switches. By the way, do you know that there is also AZ4, AZ3, AZ2 and AZ1? In fact, while such a callsign-based system looks pretty complex, it's very typical for nuclear power plants, because it allows to decrease the size of control panels really much, while they are still really big. A disadvantage is that operator had to learn thousands of codes and be able to get a proper one from their mind really fast, and sometimes almost instantly. Those panels include more devices, uh, such as loggers, which are also connected to computer. But in fact, those giant mnemonic displays are also outputs of the Scala computer. This panel provides operators with information about the position of each control rod, and the sound you can hear now is approximately what it sounded back then when it was in operation. By memories of operators, it was really loud, because those meters are mechanical, and in fact they are so-called cell synths. 
A Celsin or a synchro transducer is an induction device where rotation of a transmitter to a certain angle will be copied to a receiver. So what you see here are exactly the receivers which are also marked with different colors. And their corresponding Celsin transmitters are located in the channels inside the reactor, which are also marked with the matching colors. Transmitters are mechanically attached to servo motors of each rod and send their position to this display. Each of those meters also has a hidden illumination inside their dials, which makes them glow if, for example, a particular rod is being controlled individually. And those iconic mosaic displays are so-called mnemonic displays of reactor channels, or MTKs. And here, each square piece of this mosaic represents an individual channel. There are all in all 1661 of them. It is a pretty big number, so a special coordinate system is used to identify each during the reactor operation and reloading of its fuel rods. So each cell has a special octal notation to process and output control results in the SCALA computer. The same notations are used on the CELSINS panel. Next, specifically at Unit 1 or 2 control rooms, you can see those two panels which are called mnemonic displays of deviations, or MTO. Those are also connected to SCALA computer and they provide real-time information about such parameters as temperatures, pressures, flow rates, power levels and so on by showing special mnemonic symbols. Unfortunately, at this moment I can't tell you which symbols exactly were used and how, so drawn here is solely for kind of illustrative purposes. However, we could find this picture where it is possible to see the MTO panels in action. You won't find those MTO panels at the control room 3 or 4, and instead a second MTK display is used for the same purpose. So, using his request device, Viur, the chief reactor control engineer, can retrieve specific information from Scala and present it on those mnemonic displays. Moreover, Scala itself automatically monitors what the operator is doing and also parameters of physical, heat and hydraulic processes using a large network of detectors. For instance, it watches a flow of heat transfer fluid through every single channel, and if any deviations appear, compare it to a reference value, it will issue an alarm to those mnemonic displays. Two other connected workplaces here are also equipped with request devices, and they have own mnemonic displays. Those are custom-made luminescent indicators, and when they are operating, they look this way. Beautiful, isn't it? Let me ask you a question. Did you notice something? There are no computer monitors, like CRT displays, for instance, right? But nevertheless, it's possible to find on YouTube a video called uh, something like Last Signals of the Unit 4 that feature wannabe drag output. And it looks approximately this way. Well, I want to say the video is beautifully made and made many people interested, it's also pretty emotive and somewhat creepy, and it has 2 millions of views. But the problem is, in reality, all that look at pretty much different, like this. Because the original Scala system didn't have any monitors and all information was printed. There were two large format printer units, one for displaying the most important parameters and another one to quickly record deviations in parameters to use in case of analyzing of any emergency situations. But there were also other signals, and they were received on teletypes, like this, one of which can be found in the computer room. In fact, there were three of them. To one came monotonous messages about reaching or exceeding set points of technological parameters. On the second came messages of the operator's actions. And on the third, the messages about system malfunctions. One of the teletypes is located in the control room and can be used by operators to obtain requested information from the computer system. 
those teletypes themselves are not really unique to power plants. You could find them even in, say, post office. Uh, so it's not a matter of the closest, nearest time, yeah, but uh, I think I will find exactly the same device somewhere and wire it, make an interface and we'll try to simulate exactly this kind of output. Well, about those drag outputs of the Unit 4, the subject how everything was registered and in which way is a pretty big and pretty controversial. I think it's a good idea to make an episode about that, so if you would like to have this, please write us in the comments. As for drag program itself, it recorded three types of signals. Discrete signals, such as states of regulators, wolves and so on, and two types of analog signals, such as individual, for instance, thermohydraulic parameters of the coolant and switchable analog, say, positions of control rods. Accessing of the TOR type takes some time, and signals of the first and second types are read and processed sequentially as soon as the CPU resource window appears for the drag program. Then the signals are processed and recorded into a buffer to store it on a magnetic tape, with the time step of the moment of processing. What I want to say that, speaking about the drag of the Unit 4, there is not a zero chance that timing in that printout is not when exactly things were happening, but when they were just processed. So, what we talk about is roughly how things look at like in 1986 version. But the story doesn't end here, because the power plant continued its operation up to 2000, and it passed a very massive modernization. So, Scala also had it. So, as you can imagine, for new requirements, this solely teletype-based stuff and, well, 20 kilobytes of RAM of original Scala appeared to be really insufficient. So, around 1991, there was implemented an auxiliary information measurement system, or shortened DES. DES was based on the Ukrainian SM-1210 control computer, which is also known as M-7000. DES was overall more effective, and it could make calculations of Prisma program much faster. It could also present the results more detailed and on a visual display. That's why, if you look on post-Chernobyl footage of control rooms, you will see there a lot of computer monitors. But the most important implementation of this system allowed to increase the power of Unit 1 for 10%. Because after the known incident with the melted fuel channel on Reactor 1, its power was intentionally reduced. Well, let me know in the comments what do you think. And as for future plans, I hope that one day we'll be able to make a continuation and to review already elements of this equipment in close-up. In meanwhile, if you want to see some more interesting Chernobyl things, find some unique archives and the technical stuff, join us on our Patreon page, because there we have a lot of interesting things. So, that's it for today and thank you for watching. See you next time.